Well, welcome back to In the Word and Theofaith and uh, continuing in our weekly study through the book of Revelation today. Uh, first of all, before we get into that, I wanted to thank everyone for uh, who's continuing to watch and um, participate. I thank you for the questions that come in and I thank you for the viewership and uh, it's helpful for me. It's encouraging for me to see the channel growing slowly. Um, you could help me if you wouldn't mind, uh, but in a couple of ways. Uh, number one, your prayers, uh, your encouragement and your prayers for me to uh, uh, continue to teach this. Uh, second thing you could do is uh, on the videos themselves, you can give me a thumbs up on YouTube or put some comment in and the uh, thumbs up in the comments kind of move me up in the uh, YouTube algorithm so it gets more widely disseminated across YouTube where people can see it, hear the message from the book of Revelation. Uh, you can be praying and not only praying, but and giving me uh, thumbs up and comments, but uh, you have the opportunity to uh, uh, support the channel financially. You can help me offset some of the costs associated with web hosting and emailing and um, advertising. So you can, uh, Contribute by following the link down below this video um, and uh, contributing uh, online to help offset some of the costs. Also, um, as we get into this today, I wanted to um, just get you in your Bible, uh, chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, verses 14 through 22, go over the church of Laodicea, which we'll be jumping into in a minute. Also, I wanted to tell you that uh, every other, well, on Sundays, Sunday afternoon, down in Fort Collins, Colorado, at the Ridgeview Classical School Gymnasium, uh, myself and a friend of mine, Steve Schmeitzer, are teaching a uh, kind of a community-wide Bible study. Steve's teaching uh, Jude, uh, calling it the Act of the Apostates, and he's going through verse by verse through the book of Jude. And then um, another Sunday, so we switch off, Steve and I, I'm teaching the biblical covenants and um, um, just going through each of those covenants and uh, just emphasizing last couple of weeks how important it is to understand these covenants, how important it is to uh, understand how they shape and form uh, not only the structure of the Bible itself, but the whole Jewish mindset uh, that we find in the scriptures, and it helps us to understand more clearly just what the Bible is talking about um, and what is what is the gospel about and what's the Bible story and the Bible storyline. So we teach again Sundays at Ridgeview Classical Schools. We start about 11 o'clock, um, 10.30 to 11, to finish up at about 12, 12.30. So be there by 11 and you won't miss anything. So here we are, Book of Laodicea. We've gone through chapters 2 and 3 of the Book of Revelation so far. Uh, going a section at a time, trying to, as I said, balance um, getting bogged down in the details versus seeing the big picture. So I'm trying to strike a, strike a balance in between. Uh, this is the last church. Uh, we've seen some good churches. Um, uh, church in Ephesus, for example, the church in Philadelphia, uh, very good churches. Uh, the church in Smyrna was good, La uh, a loyal church. Uh, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, problematic churches. Laodicea, another problematic church that we'll see today. As I've discussed this uh, with you before, I want to emphasize that... Um, these are real places. They were places you could find on the map. Uh, you know, they were on a postal route uh, through Asia Minor. And um, you can go and see the ruins of these cities now. Here's the ruins of Laodicea. This was one of the uh, major roads uh, coming into the city and then going out. So you had a major road coming into the city from Asia Minor. And then going out from the city was a road to uh, Philadelphia and another road down to the coastline. 
And uh, because of these roads and an avid way of the sea, it was a very prosperous city. It was at a crossroads of commerce, a crossroads of culture, and a very prominent city in Asia Minor. Lots of buildings. Unlike the other cities, uh, excavation up to this point has not revealed a lot of uh, temples like the other cities have. No doubt that they were there, uh, but that does not seem to be the focus. One of the things that feature prominently in the uh, book of uh, or the story of the Church of Laodicea that we're going to be reading is this idea of hot, cold, and lukewarm waters and uh, very relevant to the people that lived in this area. Uh, Heropolis, which was the town north of Laodicea, was known for their hot waters, their uh, thermal springs. This is a picture of those springs. It looks like snow or the white cliffs of Dover, but what that is is minerals and salt that have encrusted along the uh, edges of those hot springs that just dot the whole landscape. In terms of background, you can find it on the map today. Denizili, Turkey is where this uh, lay, the ruins of Laodicea can be found. As I said, it's on this uh, major river and trade route. Uh, and again, as I said, Heropolis had these hot springs, mostly for medicinal purposes. Colossi had springs of cold, refreshing water. Also medicinal uh, properties associated with those. And the uh, city itself um, had a, um, a series of very sophisticated aqueducts, uh, pipes, and uh, other conduits that brought water into the city from five miles away. Uh, there was a nearby uh, medical school. Can't imagine what medicine in the first century might have looked like. But uh, some of the things that the medical school was known for was the uh, eye ointment, uh, which will be um, discussed in these verses. So it'll be something familiar to them. Um, the eye ointment was effective, apparently, had healing powers. And not only that, but uh, had a school of ophthalmology. And there was a uh, ancient ophthalmologists that we know through archaeology and surviving records uh, that practiced uh, his trade and taught nearby. The uh, city itself was demolished by an earthquake maybe 30 or 35 years before this lady or this letter was written and it was rebuilt without any Roman help. So if you recall the other cities in the area that were hit by her, uh, earthquakes, I want to say hurricanes, uh, were demolished by earthquakes, were rebuilt, but Rome gave them financial help and uh, relief from taxes during the rebuilding period. But um, this city did not. Uh, they were very proud of themselves and had a lot of civic pride because the Laodiceans did not ask Rome for help in rebuilding the city. There's a large Jewish population in the city. Uh, Antiochus the Great, about 150 BC, had 102,000 Jewish families <coughs> um, uh, relocated to the city. And then they sent considerable wealth. They sent the temple tax back to Jerusalem every year. And uh, we have records of that temple tax, so it was quite a considerable amount of money that was sent from Laodicea to Jerusalem every year. Uh, this church is mentioned uh, other times in the New Testament. Um, uh, the Colossians 2, 1, for example, here's what Paul writes. He says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. He's writing to the church in Colossae, which is not far away. Uh, on your behalf and for those who are in Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face. So Paul's writing about 65 or so. Um, he's writing from prison and he is concerned about the Laodicean church, a church that might have been 
uh, planted by a disciple of Paul and a man named Epaphras. Because later on in the same letter of Colossians, uh, Paul writes concerning Epaphras. He says, I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you. Again, we're talking about he's writing to the church in Colossae. But also for those or and for those who are in Laodicea and Heropolis. So this was a church that was planted by one of Paul's disciples and uh, was of concern. And Paul is concerned about this as was Epaphras who labored hard for this church. This is the main spring of water that um, was the source of the water that fed into uh, the way of the sea, which was, like I said, five miles away. Um, it uh, was, ca was carried along in these Roman designed and uh, Roman aqueducts that took the water into the city. And in the city itself, they were um, famous for these Laodicean uh, bathworks. Let's see, I notice my slides aren't changing on my screen here. Let me see if I can fix that for you. Just give me a second here. And we will get this working for you. There we go. Sorry about that. So these uh, bath works then out in the city, we had an outer uh, uh, area there on the left, the Apoditerion, it was a studio and uh, patrons would enter through this studio, they would receive as far as we could tell from the existing artifacts and uh, documents from that time, uh, could have a massage here with olive oil, Skin would be scraped clean. Then you would proceed into the baths themselves. There were three baths. Uh, tepidarium, which was, as the name implies, tepid water. Uh, the frigidarium, we would call that today a cold plunge. And then the caldarium, which would be the hot springs, the hot tub of their day. These are rooms around the edge of it for changing and then exit out the other side of the um, um, structure. So this was in Laodicea and it's part of the background, important to keep it in mind, it's part of the background for the, for the uh, letter that the church is going to uh, receive. So let's look at this letter. Uh, let's begin with the church in Revelation 3.14. Paul writes to the church, to the angel of the church in Laodicea. And we've talked about this, my view, the angel is a is an elder, perhaps the senior elder, a pastor of the church, who is with John and he's taking this, uh, hearing this letter. Uh, John has um, been writing this down and sending it back to Laodicea. It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of, crea of the creation of God says this. So again, Laodicea, interesting word. It's a compound word. Uh, laos and rule, the kia, rule, so the people rule. Uh, we can look at this as maybe uh, a democracy um, a, uh, from a humanist sense, uh, bring our 20 or 21st century view of it, is that this is a, a, church, a place that really celebrates the achievement of men. And again, we see that in the Kind of the rebuilding of the city. They want to depend on themselves. They're independent. Uh, they want to uh, not depend on Rome, but rather raise the money, take care of it itself, uh, be self-sufficient. Uh, we should be able to really identify with that. That's kind of the uh, zeitgeist of our own culture, the uh, kind of predominant uh, view, or has been at most points. Uh, that uh, we operate independently, we're on our own, we'll make our own living, we'll make our own fortune, we'll take care of ourselves. Uh, until recently, that was kind of the uh, outlook in the United States. He goes on here in verse 14, Jesus identifies himself uh, with three ways, really. Uh, the amen, the faithful and true witness. 
um, the beginning of the creation. So four ways here. He's echoing, as I said, the beginning of the letter. So Jesus presents himself to each of these churches by emphasizing some aspect of his person and his ministry that's going to be particularly relevant to this church. Since we're at the end of the churches, I wanted to point out and just reinforce this by saying that uh, when Jesus presents himself like this, he is presenting himself um, as the one who is the source of everything the church needs, right? So he is the one that the church should come to in their need and in their want. And his introductions to of himself to all these churches in this way indicates that, again, for every church, everywhere, at any time, uh, Jesus is the answer to every problem, to every question that they have. He looks forward to, again, uh, this letter. Uh, he's going to emphasize the faithfulness, the trueness of his witness, his amen, his yes to everything uh, that is in the word of God. This idea that he's the beginning of creation, the Greek word there is arche, which means head or ruler or start. Talking about his ownership of creation, his eternal existence, uh, that Jesus uh, is what this church needs in the situation that they find themselves in, which he is about to uh, be correcting them on. Um, there is no, this is another one of those letters where there's no condemnation. Jesus really has uh, nothing good to say about this church. Uh, they're suffering from the peril of prosperity. That is, they are materially prosperous churches, uh, like the church in Sardis, uh, but they also have this uh, spiritual poverty that uh, is in uh, making the church church. Or we saw that in Smyrna as well. The um, Bible talks about a lot of dangers that are related to wealth that we need to just take note from. Um, in the Old Testament, we see this, for example, how evil uh, lurks where there is um, prosperity. Isaiah, Joshua 7, 11, Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. They have even taken some of the things. So this is greed under the ban, have stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have put them on the, among their own things. So if you recall in uh, Joshua 7, when they were going to go into the land, their um, caution was to destroy everything, not to take anything. And uh, the uh, soldiers went in and. One family, Achan, found uh, valuables and took them and the um, wealth um, and love of riches led to evil, to transgressing the covenant. Uh, Jesus warned against my, um, how wealth will divide loyalties in Matthew chapter 6, uh, Matthew 4, verses 9 and 10. Jesus said, all these things I will give to you, or Jesus was tempted by the devil, uh, who said, all these things I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. All these things that are all the kingdoms and riches of the world that's being offered to Jesus. And Jesus said, go, Satan, you shall worship, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But Jesus didn't have the problem of divided loyalty that wealth sometimes uh, introduces. In a couple chapters later, uh, Jesus again uh, addressed this problem of divided loyalties by saying that no one can serve two masters. Either he hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So again, a, a very important um, teaching from Jesus related to wealth, and this church would have been uh, as negligent in missing this or discounting this. Wealth leads again, and we'll see it here in spades in this church in Laodicea, 
uh, to a false sense of security. Uh, even even uh, leaders of the church are sometimes susceptible to this. Uh, Paul warned Timothy to warn the church uh, this. In Matthew, 1 Timothy 6, 17, he said, Warn, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Uh, we can look at this letter to the church in Laodicea as really an um, illustration of the dangers and the riches, the dangers of worldly wealth and the riches that God supplies. Finally, if we just go through here and Look at what else the Bible says about riches when we come to Deuteronomy 10 through 14 in verse 8, chapter 8. Um, we see that uh, there's a warning there about how riches lead us to forget about God. Let me read that for you. A little lengthy, four verses, but pay attention and uh, you'll benefit from it. It's God's word. It says, when you have eaten and are satisfied. You shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware. So he's telling them, be careful here when you are comfortable in the land and thanking God for it. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. This is Moses writing. So if you forget about God, if you get comfortable, you forget about God, you no longer obey him, no longer follow him. And he says, otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and built good houses and lived in them, when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all you have multiply, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. That's a that's a whole nother Bible study just on those verses, but uh, the danger here and the uh, warning that we're going that we're looking at is that we are consistently warned through Jesus that uh, about the dangers of wealth, and we see this church uh, succumbing to those dangers. Let's go on in verses fifteen through seventeen. Let's just make a few observations in these verses before we dig in. Notice what they say. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Hmm. Because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So the, uh, the thing to notice here is the contrast between what Jesus knows and the lay of the sea and ignorance. They are, they are terribly um, misinformed, I guess we could say. We'll dig into this some more. Notice the relationship between the deeds and this uh, hot, cold, and lukewarm water, right? That these deeds, uh, what they do are being assessed. Uh, there's a lot of different interpretations about what this uh, hot, cold, and warm is talking about. Spiritual fervor, for example. But really what he's talking about are these deeds. We're going to look at that through the picture of a um, the medicine that the city was famous for and that was Kind of characterizes the context of this uh, of these verses. And finally, um, look at the um, highlighted in blue there. The sh really sharp contrast between uh, Jesus's assessment and the Laodiceans' assessment of themselves. They say, "I am rich. I've become wealthy. I need nothing." Jesus' assessment is they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. 
They are that dumb and happy as we would have said in Texas. Uh, Jesus said, you are in serious spiritual trouble. Let's dig into these verses a little bit. Verse 15. Uh, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot or cold. I don't think Jesus here is uh, saying that he wants them to be cold spiritually or hot spiritually in zeal and fervor. I think he's assessing their deeds. And we know that uh, uh, cold water was refreshing and hot water soothed. That's why they had those baths there. Um, although they're different, uh, hot and cold, each water has certain beneficial qualities. We even hope those today. We have hot springs here in the West. We have hot springs here in Colorado. Went a couple different places. We went to uh, hot springs in Montana. And uh, they're all over, really, in the United States. And uh, often with uh, what they call a cold plunge. So when you go into the hot water for a while and then you plunge your body in the cold water, supposed to have these beneficial qualities. You can look it up and see all that they are. But these was what this is what the ancients were doing as well. And he what he's saying here about their deeds is their deeds are not cold, uh, they're not refreshing, in other words, they're and they're not hot. That is, they are not soothing, they are not relaxing. Jesus' desire for this church is for them to be beneficial, to be what we would say fruitful and effective. The church is having no impact. That's what he's saying here. He's not, he's looking at what the church is doing, their deeds. He's going to trace it to their attitude ultimately. But this is a church that Jesus is contending with because they are having no spiritual impact, no spiritual effectiveness. Yeah, they've got the, they've got the uh, sign out in front of the church. Uh, they may be um, welcoming people. Uh, they are doing deeds. They are apparently a, an active church, but those deeds are really ineffective. They have no spiritual impact. So he goes on here in verse 16. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And this is this is what he's saying here. This is water that neither refreshes nor soothes. So continuing with this kind of medicinal framework, we do know that um, in the first century that there was an emetic, uh, something that produces vomiting, that was mixed in with lukewarm water. So, again, to anticipate Jesus' um, uh, invitation to a feast for, with them, uh, we pick up some of that feasting uh, anomaly, or not anomaly, but that feast, feasting imagery that uh, perhaps uh, Jesus is uh, finding it uh, intolerable really sickening that this church is so ineffective and their deeds are completely intolerable. So he is going to vomit them out of his mouth. He is going to relieve himself by taking this emetic and clearing them from his person, from his stomach. That is how um, uh, disgusted Jesus is that this church has no effective testimony for him, has no impact on the community they live in, uh, perhaps not even aware among unbelievers, or if aware, perhaps they are unbelievers are very comfortable being in this church. Uh, this would possibly be, and I don't want to read too much into it because all we're going to see is the attitude of this church. But perhaps they are what we would call a seeker-oriented church. They have dumbed down the message about Jesus, uh, softened his words so much as to be palatable for everyone. And Jesus says it may be palatable for everyone there, but it's impalatable as far as I am concerned. So 
some people look at this and this idea that Jesus is vomiting out of his mouth and they say they've lost their salvation. In fact, some would look at the whole uh, verses, the whole set of verses about Laodicea and come to the conclusion that they are, in fact, uh, a church that has lost their salvation altogether. And I'd object to that. I, I don't think Jesus is at all talking about taking away their salvation. Why do I say that? Well, I got three good reasons, I think, that I can say that. Uh, number one, um, this is a church that Jesus wants to improve. We'll see that in verse 18. He's going to call them to get better. He has not given up on them. He's calling them to stir up their zeal and repent, to turn back. And um, so Jesus isn't giving up on this church. They haven't lost their salvation. He corrects those, it says later, whom he loves. Jesus loves them, and he is correcting them. He is a, he is a loving father who loves his body. He's not going to amputate part of his body, but rather he's going to attend to it and try to make it better. And verse 20 is going to tell us that Jesus is ready to share fellowship with them. Again, he has not cost, tossed them out. Uh, he is, in fact, knocking at the door, or perhaps, and I think this is more likely, pounding on the door, demanding entrance. Jesus wants this church, and he wants their fellowship. And finally, just the whole tenor of the New Testament reveals to us that we are kept by the Father, that our salvation is secure even when we are weak. Uh, I call it the triple grip of grace, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit um, keeps us. He guarantees our salvation. In John 10, 25 through 29, Jesus says this, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Again, let me just emphasize that it's not the perfection of life, of your life or of my life, that is the test of our salvation. If there's a test, it is the direction of our life. We follow Jesus. We may have ups and downs. We may have great times, and we may have uh, times where we're spiritually cold, but ultimately we follow Jesus. And he says, I give eternal life to them. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. What a great comfort that is to us, that no one is going to snatch them out of Jesus' hand or out of the Father's hand, by extension there. And again, in Ephesians, we find that the guarantee we have in the Holy Spirit, that he is a given as, to us as a pledge of our inheritance with the view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. In other words, we are sealed by his spirit and um, the Holy Spirit of promise. And it's kind of the down payment for what's coming. And what's coming is guaranteed. So we're in this triple grip of grace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So this church is not lost, um, but this church is being challenged and this church is in trouble. And they have this opportunity to uh, prove their loyalty to Christ by listening to him. Go on with the complaint in verse 17. And uh, we see again this huge, huge contrast between uh, their own self-assessment and uh, their self-assessment and Jesus' assessment of them. First, they say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. Jesus hears this. He's aware of what's happening in the church, in this church, in all the previous six churches. He's aware of what's going on in the church today. This church has fallen into the dangers of wealth, evil, divided loyalty, false security, forgetfulness. They have fallen into those things that we've discussed. 
and they end up with this incredibly inaccurate self-assessment. And I think, brothers and sisters, uh, the Lord has put this in the book of Revelation as a warning to us of how easily even people who have the Spirit of God uh, can be um, uh, misled about our spiritual condition, how we can be misled if we uh, stray away from Jesus and his word, how quickly we can fool ourselves and fall into this um, really disaster of a church. Notice how he says, you do not know. You do not know in the middle of verse 17. This is the faithful and true witness that Jesus identified himself with as his beginning. He is, he is going to be a truth teller. That's what Jesus is going to do. He loves this church, and he's going to give them a true, faithful assessment of their dire condition. You've got to tell them. When there's problems, you got to warn. When there, you can't just let things go, as Jesus is demonstrating here, hoping that they get better. You need to introduce truth, and that's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to give them their true condition, and he's going to give it with uh, five qualities. And Jesus, you know, his ministry continues today. Uh, Jesus opens the eyes of a failing church. He's at work there. You know, I've been in, uh, involved in uh, churches that have been uh, um, doing well and churches that are uh, doing poorly and heading downhill. And it really comes back to, are they listening to God's word? Is Jesus ruling the church through his word? And here we see that uh, in these five qualities that the church is failing, and it's failing for a number of reasons. First of all, Jesus says, you do not know that you're wretched. So rather than think that they've got it all together, Jesus says, you're miserable. You're despicable. You're pathetic, he's saying. This is, this is strong medicine. And strong medicine is needed when the disease is uh, serious. You know, if you went into the doctor and he diagnosed you with a terrible form of very aggressive cancer, and I know some of you actually may be suffering from this, well, the doctor's not going to do you any good if he sends you home with a couple of Tylenol and asks you to come back in a couple of weeks and let's see how it's going. No, he's going to usually take pretty aggressive action and he's going to lay out for you exactly your condition. That's what Jesus is doing here. Next, he tells them that they are miserable. The um, literal word here is pitiable, that they're worthy of pity. They're worried worthy of being um, receiving sympathy for being such pathetic believers. Uh, Paul used the same word uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, you know, where he was talking about the resurrection and those who deny it. And Paul says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. In other words, he's using the same word that we're deserving of pity. We're in a miserable situation. Jesus says they are lacking their uh, uh, lacking spiritual worth. They are poor. Um, they're lacking divine resources. I mean, this is a uh, this is hard hitting. This is a tough assessment. Perhaps, uh, brothers and sisters, you find yourself beloved in a church that's struggling. Well, have you taken a good look at yourself? Sometimes we'll uh, say that, well, we're a church that's preaching the truth. That's why we're having such struggles. And I would say on the basis of uh, Revelation 3, 17, 16 and 17, I'd ask you, are you sure? 
Are you sure that's what your problem is? If you're sure that your problem is that you are being rejected because you're preaching the truth, uh, well, God bless you in your community. But perhaps there's something else that's wrong. Perhaps you have a woefully inadequate assessment of yourself. We need to go back to Jesus and ask him to reveal what's going on here. Don't be blind, which is the uh, fourth of these five qualities. Being blind is uh, just really being ill-equipped, having no possibility at all of assessing your true state. It might be useful to have other trusted believers come in, other Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching pastors from the area, or maybe even outside the area, come in and do an assessment and help you. Speak, speak truth into your life. In the number of counselors, there is wisdom. Finally, naked. He says that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. In other words, they're totally exposed. There is Jesus, again, is the truth teller. He sees everything that's going on. They think that they are adequate for all things. Jesus says they are naked, totally exposed. What a um, sobering couple of verses, I know, for myself uh, to sit down and really assess myself personally. Now, this is for a church, but it begins with individual, and we'll see the individuals uh, who, and their the source of their blindness here shortly. We've seen it in their assessment and their reliance on their own wealth and their own resources. Let's go on here. Uh, difficult verses. Uh, look what Jesus does here. He says, I advise you in verse 18. Sorry about that. This is going into the call in verse 18. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. Let's just stop there for a second. Notice that Jesus is no in no way abandoning this church. I mean, as, as a, in trouble that they are, as difficult situation they're in, as, um, as pathetic as this is of a group of believers, Jesus is not giving up on them. On them. He is guiding them and directing them. And this word that's translated advise in Greek means that it's a continual advising. Advising means to guide or more strongly to direct. It's a, it's a continuous thing that Jesus is doing. He's constantly available. He constantly loves his church even this church, and he's available to guide and direct them. And this is a continuous advising also in the sense that he's calling the church all the time, all the time, to be repenting and reforming. Uh, you've heard it said that if you ever find a perfect church, don't go because you're going to make it imperfect. Well, let me, have, let me tell you, there are no perfect churches. Every church has its challenges. Every church has its problems. And what that means is that every church must be continually repenting, continually reforming. Repenting, we'll see, is a change of mind that will lead to a continuing sanctification. Reforming is changing. They need to continuously bring themselves more and more in conforming and into uh, alignment with God's word. So he's asking them to continually, he's continually asking them to continually be doing that. He says, I advise you specifically to buy from me. <laughs> Jesus is all they need. No one else to go to. They don't have to go to a church growth consultant. They don't have to go to a marketing consultant. They don't have to go to anybody but him to find out what that church needs to do. And in my experience, brothers and sisters, 
when a church does this, when a church repents, when a church begins to change and try to bring themselves into the into alignment more and more fully with God's word, God will bless it. He'll bless his word. The more you put his word on the line, and the more he will honor it. And uh, the more you offer it, the more he'll honor it. But Jesus calls them and he tells them continuously, come to me. Jesus calls them to continue to repent, calls them to be um, embracing this gold, get this gold from him, uh, refined by fire. This is uh, available. Uh, you know, it reminds me of Isaiah 55, right? Isaiah 55, he calls out, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. I love that in Isaiah 55. Because he's inviting them to come and buy what they need and they don't even have any money. But he's going to provide them and he's going to provide it to them even without money. And that's where this church is. This church is at the end of the line. They are on the edge of the chasm. They are about to descend into darkness, really. Uh, the light is about to be taken from this church. And he says, even though you have nothing, come to me and I will help you. Um, raises the question. You know, if they are being so sanctified by these trials, are they to be praying for them? And I'll tell you that uh, the Bible is pretty clear, and you can look up some of these verses. God will send trials. Your church may be in a trial now, but let me tell you that it's a test, and it's an opportunity. It's a test to see whether you'll be faithful to the Lord, and it's an opportunity for you and your church to show your faithfulness, to demonstrate your faithfulness. It's your opportunity to go to Jesus and ask for what's necessary to make you spiritually rich. And what is that? Simple devotion to him. I love 2 Corinthians 11, 13, because I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You know, sometimes I think we just make things too complicated. We just make things harder than they should. We don't need to do that. If something seems too complex, it probably is. The solution is always to go to Jesus and get from him what you need. Don't be led astray by the devil away from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's the answer to the problems that the church might be having. He also tells them to get white garments. These are also available through Jesus and these white garments, as we'll see later in the book of Revelation, Revelation 19, they're symbolic of the righteous acts and good deeds. And again, as I said, every uh, challenge in the church is a testing and an opportunity. These uh, opportunities to show faithfulness, to be clothed in those white garments, to take off whatever garments you're wearing right now, whatever filthy rags that you've put on to try to resolve the problems of the church and instead replace them with good deeds, the opportunity to show faithfulness, the opportunity to bear fruit through following Christ. So again, Jesus is providing the way to restoration. Jesus is the source. He keeps calling you back. Keeps calling, come and get this gold, buy it, even if you have no money. Buy these white robes, even if you have no money. Do these good deeds. And then ISAF. And we talked about this already, right? It's uh, relevant to the context they're in. And when he's talking about uh, their blindness, he's talking about their impaired spiritual sight. Obviously, they have a 
a woefully inadequate view of themselves. They've been blinded by Satan to such the de a degree that they think they're just fine. They think they're great. They think they have everything they need and they are moving forward. And you know what? Uh, the church uh, may be expanding. If it's become a lot like the world, it may be growing very quickly. But Jesus sees it and said, you guys are just missing the boat. And he wants them to see that too. He wants them to see clearly. So he invites them to come to him. How do we do that? We come to Christ on our knees through his word. The Holy Spirit will illuminate his word. And as we compare what we're doing in the church, what we're believing, what we're teaching, how we're ministering to what the Bible says about preaching and teaching and ministering and the activities of the church, uh, we will be able to compare ourselves with what the Bible says and see clearly, clearly. Like with Jesus, this is a great assurance that John gives us in one of his other letters. He says, you have an anointing from the Holy One. You and I, brothers and sisters, and you you all know that as we have this capacity within ourselves, the Holy Spirit that seals us, truth is available. It says, I've not written you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know, because no lie is of the truth. So what John's saying is the truth is available for every born-again believer. Yes, we may be able to to get off track. Yes, we may be deceived. Yes, we may be led astray. But ultimately, the truth is with us. And if we come searching for the truth, we will find it. And that truth is always in Christ. Let's go to the call here. Again, before we get into the details, let's look at some observations here. First, notice that Jesus says, those whom I love, I reprove, and I discipline. Um, his, his reproof and discipline of the church is not to crush, but it's to show his love. We'll unpack this as we go a little bit, but look at how his love is a manifestation. His reproof and discipline is not a manifestation of his hate or his abandonment, but of his love. Um, and then he says, therefore, so his love demands a response. His love demands a certain kind of response. He says, be zealous and repent. So an intense, eager change is what his, his love demands. And again, this is continuous. This is not a one-time deal where we come to faith and then we strive to have a better quiet time or something. Uh, this is a, a kind of a response where we are zealous uh, to align ourselves more and more truly and more and more closely to the truths of God's word. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. We're not talking about perfection here. We're talking about direction. This continuous zealousness, this continuous willingness to change and align ourselves more and more fully with God's word. And then Jesus' offer at the end here, here an offer of fellowship to those who respond. So again, when we get into verse 19 in a little bit more detail, those who I love, I reprove. So reprove is to bring someone to a point of recognizing their wrongdoing. Um, sometimes reproof um, is severe because that kind of reproof is necessary. Um, looking for Titus, uh, Titus says this, he said, instruct them in good works. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at 1 Timothy. Let me scroll ahead in my uh, references, my cross-references, and give you this one, Titus 1, uh, 9 and 13. He says, first, Titus uh, is instructing, um, uh, is being instructed by Paul to hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching. So Titus is to do this, and he's to teach others to do it. 
the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, that is the apostolic teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. So Paul is telling Titus here to be preaching and teaching the word, and elders are to do the same. Then he goes on, he says, the testimony is true. The testimony, what's he talking about? The teaching. He says, the testimony is true, and for this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in faith. Sometimes reproof is severe. If you look at uh, things like uh, Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 10 or so, uh, it seems to me to suggest that there's a range of reproof that the Lord brings to those he loves. It begins with a word and escalates to scourging, very painful. So what we see from this is Jesus just loves them, loves that church too much to let them continue in their ignorance. He tells them he was going to reprove them. Did I skip one? Yep. Discipline. Uh, Pideo is to provide instruction. So he's not only uh, bringing to their attention, maybe through severe discipline, uh, severe reproof, bringing to their attention what's wrong, but then he's disciplining them. He's providing them instruction for a reform, informed and possible uh, responsible living. He's, uh, that's the discipline he brings. Sometimes accompanied, as I said, with the punishment, but he is going to do what he needs to do in order to correct the thinking stinking of his, of his people. He's going to do what, he, what is necessary. He's not going to let them go on as they are. Tells them to be zealous. He's going to reprove them discipline them, and they are to respond with zeal, that is, with great energy, great enthusiasm in their pursuit of Christ, that they are not to be looking for um, a moderate approach, right? They are to be zealous, moving out, moving out smartly, we used to say in the Army, uh, moving out with purpose, moving out with enthusiasm. Um, zeal is an important thing in the Christian life. It's something that we can stir up within ourselves when we come to Christ. It can't be misdirected. We know that the Jews had a zeal for God, but a zeal without knowledge. So Jesus is going to discipline. He is going to instruct. He is going to show the way. How do we do that? Again, we do that through the word do that through God's word. We have the apostolic teaching right here. Everything that we need, it says in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, for life and godliness is right there. Zeal is a fruit of repentance. It's a fruit of godly sorrow that leads to repentance in 2, Timothy, uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10. And it's something that uh, we need to stir up in ourselves. Not, you know, wait in our prayer closet, wait in our holy huddles. Uh, we're, again, we're not talking about just having a more effective quiet time or a better small group experience or a liver quiver during our worship. What we're looking for here is a, a zealous pursuit of repentance and reformation. Notice here the repentance, a metanoeo. Uh, noeo is, you see the English word nuthetic buried in there, N-O-E-O. Uh, nuthetic has to do with the mind. Metanoeo is ultimately a change of mind that leads to what I'd say continued sanctification. Continued growth in godliness, continued growth in hope, continued growth in stability, doctrinal stability in the Christian life. I think in this particular context, to change their mind means that they get a clear assessment of their spiritual condition, that they see clearly, 
that they take their lives and compare it to God's word. They take the condition and the deeds of their church and compare it to God's word and ask that question, are we being effective? Are we being fruitful? No, we're neither hot nor cold. What's the matter? We're depending on our wealth. We're not going to Jesus and seeking from him gold refined in fire and spiritual garments that have been cleansed and purified. We're not going to him. And they need to have this kind of change of mind that submit their life, their thinking and their whole life really to Christ. And again, this is a continuous ongoing thing. It's not something that's one and done. It's not, it's not something that we just do and then move on from. It's a way of life. That's what he's calling them to. Does Jesus stop loving? No. Does he stop reproving? Well, if he doesn't stop loving, he doesn't stop reproving. Does he stop disciplining? Disciplining. No, because he's not going to stop loving. Therefore, we need to be continuously zealous and continuously repentant. Brothers and sisters, repentance is a way of life among mature believers. That's the bottom line. We finally have this comfort. Uh, we mislabeled this a little bit. I'm sorry about that. Uh, in verses 19 through 20, so you can grab your Bible and look at those verses. Jesus says that I'm at the door and knocking, and I will come in. So he's, he's offering them a restoration of fellowship with his church. Again, this is not an issue where he is, um, this church has um, lost their salvation. You can be sure that this is a church that is saved. Because Jesus loves them and he is working in them and he is wanting to reestablish that filial fellowship with them. And he's offering, or perhaps, and we'll see why here in a second, perhaps even demanding that they restore fellowship with him. That knock, that word knock, that Jesus is knocking on the door, kuo'o. Sometimes in evangelist, it's misused, I think, in evangelistic context, uh, uh, pointed toward unbelievers. And uh, it's uh, presented as Jesus is, you know, quietly and patiently knocking at the door. But that, that word uh, can mean, as it says, uh, to strike the door, to knock on the door. But it also can mean to pound on it, to smite it. And it raises in my mind, is Jesus gently knocking or is he pounding hard on the door? And I think it's the latter. I don't think that this is Jesus uh, meek and mild uh, with a lamb over his shoulder and a bunch of kids around his feet just quietly knocking on the door of his own church asking to come in. No, I think Jesus is more urgent. I think he is pounding on the door. I think he is banging hard on that door, and he is demanding to come back in. Again, Jesus has not abandoned this church. He's not going to give up on them. He is going to be persistently knocking. You know, when Peter came from the jail and he came to uh, the home where they were uh, meeting, and uh, what was her name, Rhoda? answered the door and was shocked Peter was out there knocking on the door. I think Peter was quietly knocking, hoping someone was home. No, he had just walked out of jail. Peter was pounding on that door, wanting to get in, and um, they let him in. Well, I think Jesus is doing the same thing. He's pounding on the door, demanding to come in, and he's going to give them this comfort. Talked about the overcomers already. Because I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. Another, another invitation to fellowship. Jesus is going to move over. And uh, they are going to co-reign with him when his kingdom comes. That they are going to have significant, meaningful work to do in Jesus' kingdom. I love the way he puts it in 1 Corinthians. He tells them that, hey, look, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? So in that church, they were having some difficulty, and he said, look, don't you know that the saints are going to judge the world? 
The world is judged by you. Are not you competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So we take that, bring that here, bring that cross-reference here. What he's saying, what we can say here is that, look, open your eyes. You can fix this problem. You have a future where you're going to be reigning with me and you're going to be judging the world. Don't you think you can handle this? And they can. And you can. You can do this. Jesus is calling them and assuring them of this glorious future. So in light of what they're going to be doing in the future, they are more than equipped. They have everything they need, 2 Peter 1, 3, or 4. Look it up. Everything they need for life and godliness. So here we have, I'll let you look at this. I'm not going to read through this, but this uh, uh, summary of the Laodicean church. And um, I'm going to give you from this three signs that complacency is, is kind of settling into the church. Probably should have done this with the other churches as well, draw from them some lessons or some signs. I think it's embedded in the teaching. But next time I teach Revelation, I'll make it more explicit. First of all, uh, is the focus on pleasing everyone rather than the proclamation of God's word? That is, are you um, trying to make everybody in the church happy, uh, adjusting what God's word says? Or are you proclaiming that word as Jesus would have you? The other thing is, the other sign is whether or not the leadership of the church particularly, but the membership as well. Are you satisfied because you have a nice building or a fat budget or people that are filling the seats every Sunday? Is that your measures of success? Is that what you're looking for? Or are you looking for having a spiritual impact on the people around you? Are you looking at having a spiritual impact on the community that God has put you in? Um, I know that I've uh, recently served in a, in a church that uh, you know was prideful, I think, rightly so to a certain extent, uh, but they have been blessed, and they recognize the blessing of a large sanctuary, a large uh, auditorium, a gym, uh, plenty of classroom spaces, but they were sadly mostly empty. And, um, you know, you have at that trip point a chance to say, look how much God has blessed us with, which is good. I mean, I'm not saying to be, pres to be dismissive of God's blessing but also an opportunity to say, are we using this with effectiveness? And we all have to do that. Are we using uh, the building? Are we using our money? Are we using our people in a way that uh, makes us fruitful and effective? And what is the result of that? What is the evidence of fruitfulness and effectiveness that we can see? And finally, one of the things to watch out for is whether or not there's really a loss of um, eagerness, zeal for effectiveness and fruitfulness. Have we, have we decided that we're done on both sides? We're not going to change anymore. We have nothing to repent from. We have no corrections to make. If that's the case, if, not, if we're not continuously repenting, in reforming, that's on the downward, downward slope that leads to complacency and leads to a church like we see the church in Sardis. So there we are. We've finished this second section of the book of Revelation, the things which are. Uh, next time we'll be moving into the things which shall be. And the focus is going to shift from what's going on among the churches, to what's going on in heaven. It's going to shift from the um, things that are, that are and are now to the things which will be what's coming. And we'll see that as we uh, 
continue on our weekly study. God bless you, brothers and sisters. I went a little long, about 10 minutes long. Forgive me for that. And I pray that, uh, that you find this to be uh, useful for you, encouraging, and that because uh, you know God's word and you understand better what he's doing and what it says, that you're able to not only stand firm individually, but also that you are a, a force for uh, greater godliness, greater effectiveness, and greater fruitfulness in your church. God bless you, brothers and sisters.